story. Moderna's successful phase one trial of a COVID-19 vaccine. Let's bring back in Meg Terrell. She is standing by tonight with a volunteer who has gotten the shots, Ian Hayden. Meg, take it away. Scott, thanks so much. And Ian Hayden, thank you for being with us tonight. You're one of the first 45 people in the world to have received what could be a coronavirus vaccine. We have to say thank you to you for being willing to volunteer for a trial like this with so many unknowns. Tell us how you heard about the trial and, and why you wanted to volunteer. Yeah, I, I learned about the study initially from a coworker um, who shared a form where I could sign up and express interest. Um, and, and my reason for volunteering is pretty simple. It's just I'm, I'm fortunate to be in good health. I happen to live in a city where one of these early trials is taking place. And this seemed like an obvious way I could step up and, and help out in a small way in this time of crisis. Were you scared at all to undertake something that was so unknown? I mean, a new technology, Moderna's technology, a brand new virus. Was it scary? You know, no, I, I haven't been scared. I haven't been worried. I suppose if, if you are the worried type, you're not the kind of person who's going to sign up for a phase one study. Um, but, you know, I don't think I'm taking on a huge amount of risk here. It, it doesn't feel like I'm stepping in front of a train or anything like that. You know, the technology has been used uh, in clinical trials for other diseases before. Of course, there are risks to a clinical trial like this, just like any clinical trial. But if people aren't willing to take on those small risks, then we're never going to get to a vaccine. Right. Well, tell us about your experience. We understand you received the injection with the first dose on April 8th, and then 28 days later, you received a second dose. What did it feel like? Was it just like any other shot? What was your experience? It really was. Yeah, the injection itself was quite unremarkable. Um, if I'd had my eyes closed, I wouldn't have known that it happened. Um, I'm a bit afraid of needles, so I was just as nervous about getting the blood work done as I was for the injection. Um, but it, it was fine. Um, I had a bit of arm pain after the first injection, pretty typical of, of any vaccination, really. Um, after the second dose, I did feel a little crummy the day after, um, but that passed uh, after about 24 hours. And, and overall, I felt during this trial, just like I did before this whole experience started, which is to say, uh, fortunate to be, to be in good health. What was it like for you seeing the results come out from Moderna this morning? And had you had any of your own results communicated to you? Yeah, that was interesting. Um, you know, as part of the study plan, plan, I think it's pretty routine. Participants are not told any of the data ahead of anyone else. So I actually learned about the results on Twitter. I learned about it through the corporate press release, like a lot of people with, with no warning. Um, you know, it's it's pretty strange to to read a corporate press release talking about data and know that you're you're the person behind that data. Um, so that was a bit of a trip for me. Yeah, I bet that would be pretty crazy. I know that you know eight of the patients that Moderna reported the neutralizing antibody results for. The, that's the data that is so important because it shows that those people were really creating the immune response that could potentially block the virus. Um, do you expect to learn your own results at any point to know whether you personally are generating those neutralizing antibodies? I, I hope to learn that. Um, it seemed from this press release that, that the participants all zero converted. So I believe that I have antibodies. I don't know that they're the neutralizing antibodies that we're looking out for. Um, but like I said, I'm not going to learn any of that any sooner than anyone else. So we'll have to wait until the next press release from Moderna, um, from the regulators about what those look like. You know, you wrote a piece in the Boston Globe, uh, maybe it was a week ago, uh, saying that you would be open to a human challenge trial. Um, the concept of that being uh, to speed up getting the efficacy results, that you would volunteer to be exposed to live virus. Uh, just tell us about, you know, whether anybody has approached you about this idea and, and why you'd be willing to take on that additional risk. Yeah. So I said I, I would be interest, interested in doing something like that if conditions were right. So I'm not looking to rush into a human challenge study, the idea of exposing someone to the virus. Um, I, you know, I think it obviously uh, comes with risks, including the risk of death. So there are many conditions that would have to be right for me to seriously do something like that. So in my, in my op-ed, I outlined what those conditions would be. 
Those have to do with uh, FDA approval, they're signing off of the process, and a really clear sense that doing a human challenge trial really is going to speed up the results and get us closer to a vaccine. No one has approached me about, about doing a, a challenge study. It's my understanding that nobody is planning one at this point, although I have heard that the FDA is, is considering that option and is talking about it and is willing to work with others. Um, you know, challenge studies have been done before for other diseases, and this is such an extraordinary time. It does make sense to have those conversations now. You know, one of the other uh, things that people have talked about being necessary for a challenge trial is to have um, useful drugs to treat people um, if the virus does infect them. You know, our only real drug that's proven efficacy is remdesivir. From any of the news coverage you've seen of that, would that make you more comfortable uh, entering a challenge trial? It's certainly better than nothing. Um, but, you know, my, my thoughts on the risk to myself personally have more to do with the fact that I'm, I'm younger, I'm 29, I'm, I'm right in that sweet spot where it seems like if I do catch COVID, um, it probably isn't going to kill me, it would, you know, sicken me and, and I would probably fully recover. Um, so that gives me hope. You know, that has a, obviously that is going to play a factor into how you would do a human challenge study. You would probably need to exclude the elderly. You would need to exclude people who are most likely to die from infection. And that, of course, is going to limit the efficacy of that or li limit, you know, what a human challenge study is going to tell you at the end of the day. So there are compromises there that would have to be struck. As well, this is Scott. I, I'm, your level of bravery is, is uh, absolutely remarkable. Um, you're quite modest, too, about uh, your efforts here. I'm just wondering if this turns out to be the one, if this vaccine turns out to be the thing that saves millions, if not tens or hundreds of millions of lives in the future, how you will feel knowing that you played such an integral role in helping that happen? Yeah, the way I look at it, Scott, really is that it's an integral role, but it's a small role. I'm one of 45 people in this trial. This just happens to be the first. There will be many trials. And, you know, I hope this is the one. But in a bigger sense, I hope that there's more than one, right? The world needs a vaccine. It needs multiple vaccines. And getting to a successful vaccine, one that is safe, one that is effective, is never the result of any one person. It's not just the volunteers in the study. It's the clinicians who conduct it. It's the researchers who develop this coronavirus vaccine candidate, but also the researchers who spent their entire lives researching coronaviruses, researching the proteins and the mRNA technology going into this. So it really is a team of thousands of people. And, and hopefully that team can get over this finish line as soon as possible. Well, we're grateful for all you're doing. I, I know I speak on behalf of everybody who's watching and or listening right now. Ian Hayden, I appreciate it so much. Meg, thanks to you, uh, as always. I'll bring Dr. Gottlieb uh, back in. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb, when you, when you hear a story like Ian's, um, how does it make you feel? Well, look, there's a lot of people out there who um, take some risk entering these clinical trials, and it's essential to the scientific discovery process. There's going to be many more people who enter these clinical trials until these products are ultimately brought to market. The clinical trials for these vaccines are going to involve tens of thousands of patients. It was a nice detail that Meg elicited about how he found out about the results from a press release. And one point of clarification, um, you probably wouldn't enroll anyone who's already been vaccinated with an experimental product in a subsequent clinical trial. So, in fact, he wouldn't be eligible for some of the challenge studies if, in fact, those went forward. But uh, he was certainly brave to enroll in this, vac this vaccine trial because there was a lot of uncertainties at the outset of this, and there still are a lot of uncertainties. It's amazing, though, that sort of the nameless and the faceless, other, th other than an appearance on a television program, we never generally know who ends up being responsible in these groups for a vaccine uh, for any illness, for that matter. Yeah, it was a nice interview. And, um, you know, there's going to be thousands of people behind him. He's right. But uh, it's always difficult to be the first. Um, these early stage trials uh, are difficult to enroll sometimes because you don't have a lot of information about the products. And so the people who step forward to do this are exceedingly important to the scientific discovery process.